Hello and welcome to Scripting for Artists. My name is Sibirin. And in this episode, we are going to play Minecraft. <laughs> okay, yeah, jokes aside, my name is not Sibirin. And we are going to play on zillyhoon.com. Uh, the vanilla Minecraft server with the name Laser Land. And Sibirin is actually the dude who is doing the Blender uh, thingy videos. We watched the first episode and the last episode. <laughs> Um, if that makes sense and yes so goals for this episode are yeah rebuilding the base that got griefed twice I don't know um, so I don't even know why I'm rebuilding all of this but I, I feel like um, so that's probably a stupid idea but nobody's gonna stop me <laughs> Um, and we are going to watch more episodes of uh, scripting for artists from the from the Blender series from the official Blender channel on YouTube. Um, yeah, I, I didn't find episode two, so that's why we are watching episode six. And it's only fifteen minutes, so we will probably watch the whole playlist um in this episode and yeah let's see how how, how that works out uh, i i quickly clicked through all of them already they all seem to be under creative commons that's also why i know the intro by heart already um yes then without further ado i would say let's get started and learn some blender while Rebuilding a griefed base on Laser Uh Yeah, you can connect via zillyhoon.com. Uh, yeah, which would, which is probably a wise idea to to promote that domain. I don't know. So this is basically an advertisement video, and I will just play the game here, and I'm I'm trying to like investigate a little bit how the new host performs and so on and yeah this is the moment where you can close the video and just join the server because i will just be watching a video about blender um let's go hello and welcome to another episode of scripting for artists my name is siblin and this episode is about blender collections these were introduced in blender 2.80 and replaced the numbered scene layers and groups i'm not recording this as usual at the blender institute but i'm home right now as so many of you and as a result the video will be less scripted and I won't have any slides to show so we'll just dive into Blender and I will show things there. So in the outliner here you can see that we have a scene collection with uh, Suzanne in it, like one object, and it has the default collection collection one. So given that this thing here is called the scene collection let's look at the scene object and see if we can find a collection property. So here we have Suzanne, and as a reminder, here we have the convenience variables. So capital C stands for bpy.context and capital D stands for bpy.data. Um, you can't use these in your own scripts, but you can use them here in the console while you're figuring things out. So let's take a look at scene.call, then press tab, and you can see it already has a collection property. Um, we can get its name. It's called Master Collection because it's the, 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 the main scene collection. Um, and it has a property called Objects. And if you convert that to a list, just arrow up and then type list with parentheses around the line. And there you can see that one object, Suzanne, that was here. Collection of objects gives you all the objects that are directly linked into that collection. So let's see what happens when we move Suzanne into collection one. It's still indirectly inside the scene collection because it's inside collection one and collection one is inside the scene collection. But it's no longer in the scene collections dot object. If you want to have really everything, then look at all underscore objects. This is like a magical view that will give you everything in the collection itself. So it contains everything that objects also contains but then it also contains everything that is inside collections, in the collection, in the collection, in the collection. And as you can see, we have Suzanne. 
So as many things in Blender collections have to have a unique name because they are stored in data. So we have dpy.data or in the console capital D dot collections and this gives us the collection one. It does not contain the scenes master collection but it contains all the other collections. So here we also can get the collections collection one objects and convert it to a list to see what's in there and again of course there is Suzanne in there. So this already gives you a way to given the name of a collection iterate over all the objects in that collection. So maybe you want to write an exporter that exports uh, everything in one particular collection. Now you know how to access it. And I'm saying iterate over the objects. Uh, let's just take a look at how that would happen just to refresh your memory. So let's say we have a nice little behemoth. going on here with four Suzanne's in that one collection. If we say list the collection dot objects then we get all four of them of course. So let's take a little example of how it would look like in a little bit more complex code. You would basically say well collection is a call or call or what you want to call it is collections collection one and then I can say for ob in Call dot objects print of name is of dot name and this is a format string. It's really useful. You can just type an f before the opening quotes, and then within curly braces you can write any expression like of dot name. And what you can see here, it lists all the names of all the objects. So oh, it it's so hard to follow this video somehow. Oh my gosh. And then does something with it. And this could be calling an exporter or this could be setting material or it could be changing the name or whatever you want to do, of course. And in our case, it just prints the name. So let's take a look at creating a collection from Python. This is also done through the data.collections uh, collection. So D dot collections, and uh, let's take a look what do we have. We have a new function. So let's type new, tab, and you can see that you can type name. And now we have a new collection called demo. You want to use this collection as it's given to you because, of course, this is now available at the PyData collections demo. Ah. This happens to the best of us. Everybody makes typos, don't worry about it. We can get, given the name demo, we can get the collection again. And uh, this is a big, big pitfall that you could fall into because you may think that that collection that you just created with an M demo will have an M demo. Well, let's take a look at what happens when we do it again. Exactly the same function call, just telling Blender to make me a new collection called demo. But this time we already have a collection that is called demo. And as I said, collections have to have a unique name. So what happens is that it calls it demo.001 as you're used for Blender. But now the name that we asked Blender to give the collection is not the same as the name that the collection was given. So if you now access BPI data collections demo, you will see that you get demo, of course, and not demo.001. So what I would say is always when you create a new collection, assign it to a name like this, and then you're sure that you have the right collection. It looks kind of cool, like with these uh, broken floors, in my opinion. I, I like the style. For artists, and it will have the new name. One thing you may notice in the outliner up here is that the name isn't there. Like the collection is not there yet. So it exists in the blend file, it exists in, in memory, but it's not linked to the scenes master collection yet. So how do we do that? Well, 
you go to the master collection and then dot and tab to just get a list of everything that's in there and <coughs> one thing you'll notice is this property called children and that contains all the child collections so that's all the collections that are linked into this collection so let's take a look there and there you find a function called link at this collection as a child of this collection well it's a bit cryptic two times this collection referring to different things but i think you get the gist uh, we have a collection in the name collection so keep your eyes on the outliner while i press enter there we go and now it is part of the scene collection Linking objects into this new collection is pretty much the same thing as linking other collections into it. Instead of using .children.link, you use .objects.link. So let's take a look. We have our collection. It has an empty, empty set of objects. Nothing is in there. And we can use .objects.link to link an object to it. And like that, we can add Suzanne.003 to it. Now let's put this into a bit more of a script. So I'm going to subdivide here and change to the text editor. Create a new script. Call it uh, move stuff.py. Always start with input bpy. And now let's say we want to move everything that is inside one collection and move it into another. Uh, so we have to have a collection from is bpy data collections collection one. And we have something similar, collection two is bpy data collection sfa. So now we have our two collections. Let's loop over one and then add all the objects that we find into the other. So for of in call from dot objects call to dot objects dot link of. And this will already copy or well, link all the objects from one collection to the other. What's left to move is to unlink from the other collection. So we need to unlink from call from. But that also means removing that object from call from dot objects. So that means that by unlinking, we're changing the thing that we're looping over currently. And this is not a good idea. You shouldn't do this. It, it, at best, it will be uh, unpredictable. And at worst, it will crash Blender and you will lose your data. The most simple solution for this, of course, there are many of them, but the simplest is to keep track of the objects that you want to unlink. So let's say to unlink is an empty list. And in this list, we will keep track of whatever we want to unlink later. So we can say to unlink dot append all. And once this for loop is done, uh, we can loop over this and unlink everything. So for of in to unlink, call from dot objects dot unlink and this will work. Let's give it a try. And my script failed, of course. Let's take a look at the console. If we look at the terminal from which I started Blender, you can see that it gives me a runtime error. Object is n.003 already in collection SFA. And OK, fair enough. It doesn't like us linking an object that is already in there. So there's basically two ways in which to avoid um, your script breaking because of an error like this. Uh, one is to avoid the error to begin with, and the other is to handle the error when it occurs. And I think in this case it's easiest to just catch the error and make sure that our script keeps running when that happens. So the error says that line number 8 is the problem, so let's take a look at line number 8. So line eight is this line in the code. It's the linking itself, of course, that goes wrong. And 
you can tell Python to just give this line a try and see what happens. So literally you say try and then a colon and like the for loop and the if and the other things that we've seen that and in a colon you have to indent the rest. Leave comments and um, I'll see you in the next episode. Hello, welcome to Scripting for Artists. My name is Sibylin and today we will look at for and while loops. On Twitter, Roger asked, Hello and welcome to Scripting for Artists. My name is Sibylin and in this episode I will show you how to create your own operator. So far we only created snippets of code. You can use them, but they're not the most user friendly. Many people have asked for ways to create menu monkeys, then this is the place to do it. Um, the execute function is also what gets called from Python directly. So if you call an operator like something or something, this is the function that gets called. Then we have invoke. This function is called when the operator is called from a menu or a button. Uh, if you want to do something extra in that case, you want to have slightly different behavior, then you can do that in invoke and you can then call your execute function from there. And now we get to the most complex, the modal one. The modal function is for special operators that need to run for a longer period of time. This receives all kinds of events from Blender, from when you move your mouse, you click on buttons, you use the keyword, uh, that kind of stuff. Things like the Blender Cloud Texture Browser or CG Cookies Retopo Flow are implemented like this. If after all of this you're in doubt about which function to use, keep it simple, just use the execute function. If that turns out not to be able to do what you want to do, then you have a concrete reason to look at something more complex, but before that just keep things simple. Now let's turn this into an actual operator that we can use. Let's create some more monkeys. Let's start by removing what we don't need. Let's keep it simple, just an execute function. If you look at the mesh operators, you can see that they start with bpy ops mesh primitive monkey add, for example, or uh, here bpy ops mesh primitive icosphere add. So all the operators that create a new mesh object, they start with mesh. So let's keep doing that. So the ID name becomes mesh, and we're going to create a monkey grid. So monkey grid uh, label monkey grid. The tool tip will be uh, let's spread some joy and then the class name we have to change that becomes the category underscore ot underscore monkey grid the execute function has to do something but it also has to tell blender whether everything succeeded or not so if everything was alright you return finished and that tells blender that the code actually performed well but maybe your operator cannot work. Maybe it is for extruding a mesh and the mesh doesn't have any vertices. Um, so in that case, you return cancel. There are a few other options and they are all described in the manual. To go there, you go to help and then Python API reference and then to the section about bpy.ops. So let's assume that everything will work correctly. We will return finished and now all we have to do is put the code here that creates our monkey grid. So let's copy the code from chapter 3 of Scripting for Artists and put it here. So this creates our 600 monkeys in rows of 25, um, having one unit, like a blending unit, between them. The operator is almost done already. So we have all the ingredients here. The only thing that we need to do now is to tell Blender that this operator exists. And this is called registration. Fortunately, this is rather simple. We just call bpy.utils.register class and then the name of the class, in our case, mesh ot monkey grid. Um, for symmetry, there should also be a unregister function. <coughs> so that looks like this. Instead of calling register class, it calls unregister class. So it basically undoes what the register function was doing. And then we're almost there. It's just that, as you know, when you have a function like this, it's not automatically called when you run the script. And there's a little trick for this. If you add some magic like this in here, and it looks a bit weird, but basically what this means is that if this script is run, then it should call the register function. There's multiple ways in which uh, Blender can access your script. It can execute it, but it can also be imported from something else. Just like we import BPy, other code can import this file as well. 
So there's a distinction between being imported from somewhere else and being run. And only when it's being run should it call the register function, and that is what this code does. So now what we can do, let's just name this monkey grid dot pi for good measure, and then let's click play. And nothing happened, which is kind of a good thing. Uh, we didn't see any error message. Our code doesn't show any message. So the silence is kind of good here. So let's see what happens now. Gpi ops mesh. There we go. We can create a monkey grid. The operator is there. Let's spread some joy. Let's not call it here. Let's see if we can find our new operator here in the F3 menu. It's a monkey, and there's your monkey grid. So mm, that's pretty bad. Cool. Press enter to execute it, and as you can see, blend enough freezes while it's creating the 600 monkeys. And this is what happens when you do something that takes time in the execute function, and that is okay. The code is part of this blend file, so let's see what happens when we create a new blend file. And as you can see, the operator is still there. It's been loaded into memory of Blender, it's been registered, and it just keeps ticking around. Now let's see what happens if we restart Blender. And now the monkey grid operator is no longer there. And this is because Blender doesn't just execute all the scripts that it can find in a blend file, you have to tell it to do that. First you have to make sure that the name of the text file ends in .py, and then here in the text menu, you can check the register checkbox. That let's say work. Restart Blender. Error. Burr. And now it's there. So let's have some fun and add some parameters. When you add a cube, what you see here on the left is called the redo panel. When you open it, you see different parameters that you can set. So what happens is that when you change a parameter's value, Blender pushes the undo button automatically and then re-executes the operator. And that is why it's called the redo panel, because it's redoing things all the time. So let's add support for the redo panel to our operator. We start by declaring the properties that we want to have. And this will be the number of monkeys in the x direction, number of monkeys in the y direction, and monkey size. Just like operators live in bpy.ops, the properties live in bpy.props. So again, if you want to have more information, just go to help, python api reference, and then click on the bpy.props section. I'll show you what it looks like. Let's call it count x bpy props int property. Int stands for integer, which means a whole number because we cannot have half monkeys. So count x has to be either one or two or three, but it can never be like two point five or something. So it's whole numbers only, and this declares that we want to have that property. There's a big difference between the colon that we have here and the equal sign that we have there. This sets a name to a value, and this is for things that just have to be set. We have to set bill ID name to mesh mode grid to make it work. But here we don't really set anything, we just declare to Blender this is an int property, please act accordingly. You can add some parameters here to change the behavior. First of all, we should set a name. We can call it x, it may be a bit cryptic, but for now it will do. And we can add a description, number of monkeys in the x direction. So let's copy this to the y, name is y, and number of monkeys in the y direction. And we have a size, which is another bpy props dot float property. Float stands for floating point, it's a technical term for just decimal numbers. Name is size, description is size of each monkey. So this gives us our properties, but they're not used yet. So let's take a look at the execute function where we're supposed to use them. This comment, it has to go because we're no longer creating 600 monkeys in rows of 25, uh, but it's all flexible, so let's remove that for now. Now we have to access the properties. So we've declared them, and this self gives us access to the actual value. Self is a Python thing, and I won't go into detail here about what it represents. Uh, just know that 
If you declare a property here as count x, then you can access it here as self.countx. So the total number of monkeys is the number of monkeys in the x and in the y direction, and this 25 here was the number of monkeys in the x direction. And then all that is left is to set a size. And that's it. Let's give it a try. Let's see what happens in the console first. And there you can see our properties, count x, count y, size, and they're all equal to zero because we haven't set any default yet. And there we have our three monkeys. Before we go to actually call it from the viewport, let's set some sensible defaults. Default is three. For the y, default is two. I choose different values there on purpose. This is the default, so when somebody clicks on the monkey grip button or, or selects it from the F3 list, this will be what they see. Because they see a three by two grid, no. They immediately know what they need to change. If they want to change the 3 to a 4, they just change the 3 to a 4 without having to think about whether it's the x or the y direction. So if we were to give them the same default, then they wouldn't be able to see it, and then they would have to think, like, which direction is x, which direction is y, which value do I want to change? And this is why I give them distinct values. Finally, the default for the size, run again delete everything and there you can see your defaults and when we execute without any values it just uses those defaults and the same for the F3 menu there's one more step left and that is to get the redo panel we have the properties so Blender knows what should hypothetically go in there it just doesn't know yet that we support that redo panel let's tell Blender that we do. This is done through BL options. The default value is register and we have to add undo to it. This will give us the final ingredient. There you go. Now we can make them big and small and give them even invalid values. So to make it pleasant to use for people, we should really set limits to these sliders so that it's all sensible values that you can select there. Fortunately, this is again quite simple. We can set a minimum. Let's set it to one because creating zero monkeys doesn't make sense and creating negative monkeys even less. So let's start at one. Let's set the maximum to 10 for now. We can do the same for the count y and we can set the size 0 to minimum and the maximum, let's set it to 1. And now we can drag and things are still nice and sane. You can see that it already gets a little bit slower when these numbers increase and we still can't get to the 600 we had before. Even when I type 100 here it is cut off to the maximum. So this is why Blender has a soft limit. The hard limit is what we set now. That's the absolute limit of the value of the property. Whereas the soft limit is what the slider will do when you drag around. So if you want to allow maximum values that are bigger than 10, or sizes that are bigger than one, but still want these limits as the limit for the slider, you can change the maximum into a soft maximum. The minimum that we have now really is the minimum because creating zero monkeys doesn't make sense, negative monkeys is impossible, also creating a negatively sized monkey is impossible, so let's change the maximum to soft. Now the dragging is still the same, but we can set it to create much more monkeys than you would get with dragging. Now let's get back to that class declaration. I will explain a little bit more about how classes work in an intuitive way, I hope, uh, without going too much into technical details. Classes use a system called inheritance. Just like with people, uh, it's like a parent-child structure. So in this case, bpy.types.operator is the parent, 
and Mesh OT Monkey Grid acts as the child. If you ask a child a question that he knows the answer to, say, you want to have a cookie, the child will say yes immediately, without asking the parent, of course. But if you ask about taxes, then, Mom, please help me out here, because I don't know anything. And then the <laughs> child defers that question to the parent. And this is the same way that classes work in Python, roughly. We could do without the BL options. Our child didn't know anything about it, so Python asked the parent. And when we want to have something different, we can add VL options to our child, to our class. And then that is asked first, so that takes precedence over whatever the parent wants. So we always have lucky children who gets all the cookies they want. So before I end this video, I have two more things that I want to tell you. One, again, we look at the execute function. You see that it gets a context parameter, and this is pretty much like the context we've seen before. <laughs> it gives us context of object, context of scene, context to dot selected objects, all these things you've seen before in vpy.context. It gets here as well, but then localized specifically for this operator. So as a general rule of thumb, if you have a function that gets a context, use that context, and don't use vpy.context. So if you want to do something with all the selected post bones in this execute function, you would use context dot selected post bones. Another function, and that is the second thing that I wanted to show you. Another function that gets context is the poll function, and it's written in a bit weird way. Uh, but just take it from me; it works like that. Again, you get a context in this function, but instead of doing something, like instead of performing an action, this function is meant to check whether that action will be possible. So this poll function is called by Blender every time this operator is supposed to show up in a menu or as a button on a panel. I can show you how this works. Right now it returns true, which means that it is always allowed, just as it was before, and just as it was before, it shows up here in the F3 menu. When I change this to false, it will never show up anywhere, which is kind of useless. Let's tweak this to make it a bit more useful. You can see here in the console, we have autocomplete, which makes sense in a Python console. But that same operator does not work in the 3D viewport, because the context is wrong. This is also something we can do ourselves. Right now, when I change this to true again, the monkey grid operator also shows up in the context of the Python console, and it will show up anywhere in Blender, which is not exactly the right way to go. Let's take another look at a variable inside that context. Context.area gives you the area that is currently active in Blender's user interface. So, in this case it would be the console, but if the mouse is here and we pull up the F3 menu, then all of a sudden it's a 3D viewport that is active. And here it would be the outline. So every area in Blender has its own area type, and we can use that in our poll function to make sure that it's only working in the area that we want it to work. One thing I don't really like is guesswork. So we know now that the area type of the console is console, but is it in 3D viewport? Is it 3D view? 3D underscore view? Uh, is it 3D viewport? I don't know. So let's make our script tell us instead. I can just say print my area is context.area.type. And let's see what happens on the terminal where all these kind of prints are sent to. Here you see the console, and immediately you see it being called my area is view 3D. But when I do it here in the outliner, my area is outliner. If I do it here in the properties panel, my area is properties. So that way you can just use these print statements to know what you have to put where. So we now we know which value to use for the 3D viewport, so let's just do that. If context.area.type equals view 3D, then return true, otherwise we can return false. Let's see how this works. Here it still shows up, 
but here is no longer there. And of course here and there, now it only shows up where we want it to show up. One final thing, these kind of constructs, I see them a lot, also from experienced programmers, is more complex than necessary actually, because this guy yeah, is already an expression so that is true or false. false yeah. So basically what the code is saying is that if the value of this thing, this select Hello and welcome to Scripting for Artists. My name is Sibylin and in this episode we'll be looking at creating your own add-on. In the previous video we took our existing code to create a monkey grid, added some stuff around it to turn it into an operator. And in this video we'll do basically the same. We take our existing operator, we add some code around it, save it to a different place, and then we'll have our add-on. Up to now our code has always been inside the blend file itself, and this is perfect for situations where it is specific to that blend file, if it was one itch you wanted to scratch there. However, this is not always useful, because you maybe want to use it in different blend files as well, you always want to have it available to you, and maybe you even want to share your code with colleagues or with friends. And in all these cases, turning your code into an add-on is really the right choice. In this video we'll look at the following. We'll look at what is actually a code file and how do you edit it. We'll look at ingredients of an add-on. We'll turn our monkey grid operator into a monkey grid add-on. And finally we'll be looking at something we'll what be doing the speed a lot, hack. Which is Guys, was I tripping or did the skeleton have a big speed hack? Boy! Your code after editing it. So let's get started. What is a code file actually? Well, you may have guessed it, it's actually just a plain text file with a name that ends in .py and there really is nothing more to it. Editing the code is also simple, you can pretty much use any text editor out there. Uh, just don't use a word processor like OpenOffice or Microsoft Word because those are really not for just plain text. You may be tempted to use Blender's own internal text editor for it. After all, it even has syntax highlighting for Python that means that it has some basic knowledge of Python, it knows the keywords like for and if and def, and it can color them differently, making it easier for you to understand the structure of the code. But with Blender's editor I always get confused, I never know whether I'm editing a text file that is part of Blender, or that is externally saved to disk. To save the file you have to press Alt S and not Control S, otherwise you save the blend file instead of the text file. I would rather recommend something different, something more suitable for the task. My personal favorite is Visual Studio Code. It's an open source project by Microsoft and is a really nice editor. Other popular choices are Atom or Sublime Text or if you want a really big pie charm. There's lots of choice out there so I recommend just download a few, give them all a try, see what you like best. As for the name of the code file, I already mentioned that it has to end in .py. There are a few more requirements though, you don't have to know all of them. If you just stick to letters without any accents, underscores and numbers, you'll be fine. If you want to know more about creating add-ons, you can go to Help, Manual and there go to Advanced, Scripting and Extending Blender. And there's a lot of info there, including an add-on tutorial. Now let's look at the ingredients of an add-on. There were three things that you really have to have in your add-on. At what the top the of the file there should be some metadata How much life in does a creeper have? Gift. And this metadata should include the name of the add-on which That's not how you say it, right? How much life does this creeper have? I, I should really step up my English game How much health? I don't know But uh, I feel like with lower DPS you also deal less damage or Well, for sure the fire damage will be lower, I assume, because you have fire damage per tick or something and you have less ticks so you have less damage maybe maybe what I was used to the fire damage but I don't know Blender is compatible with it the category the add-on should be in and some other info the second and third thing you need to have you've already seen and that's the register and unregister functions these functions tell Blender what your add-on contains so that it can be loaded and unloaded properly the BL info you see at the top is called a dictionary, and this is basically a lookup table. Uh, we've seen it before in chapter 5 of Scripting for Artists. Okay, let's get this miniature add-on to work. First we have to save it to a location on disk. It doesn't really matter where right now, because we will install it, and then Blender will copy it into the final location, and we can edit it from there later. So, I'm going to save it to my Scripting for Artists folder, and I'm using only lowercase letters and underscores for the name, ending the name in .py. Now we have to install the add-on. Go to User Preferences, go to Add-ons, Install, 
and find our smallest add-on. Now the add-on is installed and Blender copied it for us to the right location. You can see we're here. So it is uh, my home directory dot config slash blender slash the version of blender scripts add-ons smallest add-on dot pi. We could have manually put it there. That's all fine as long as the file is there is good. But this way Blender tells you where it has to go. You can see that the user interface shows very little information about our add-on. So before we even enable our add-on, let's see if we can fix that. We could go back to the Blender text editor, change the file, save it again, install it again, overwriting the file we just installed, and then click refresh. But I think that's too much work, so let's just take this file that you see here and open that in a code editor instead. So here's a little trick for you. If you want to figure out where a Python file is, you can import it. So you can say import smallest add-on and this load. How our did add this shit you can work? See that oh my gosh, I have to look it up again. Every time. Like literally every time. Is it the bedrock crafting or what, what is going on here or do I need the dark wood? I mean, dude, or did it change and why are there so many alternatives? That's hilarious. Is it like... Oh, boy! <laughs> uh, a register function for example that prints hello world. And we have an unregistered function that says goodbye world, as we expected. So this gives you access from Blender to your add-on, and there's a secret name there that doesn't just show up. Underscore, underscore, file, underscore, underscore. And that will give you the file that the add-on is stored in. So this you can copy-paste into your editor and actually open the file. So here we are in Visual Studio Code, and let's open a file. And of course the file open dialog is very platform specific. In my case I can just paste the file name with Ctrl V, press enter and then I open the file. And here we see the code that Blender just installed for us. It is our code file. Now let's extend that build info dict with some more information. First let's add an author field. You can add an email address if you want, uh, that way people can easily reach you. The rest of the fields are documented in the Python API manual. So in Blender, just go to help Python API and then search for BL info. Here are some more of the fields that I just copied from that documentation. Location is the location of your add-on where people can find it in Blender itself. Since we won't have any user interface yet, we can just type operator search here and then people will have to find it for themselves. Description just describes the functionality of your add-on. More monkeys! The other fields will leave empty for now. I've saved it with Ctrl S. We're back at the user preferences in Blender and we have changed the file on disk. So let's click the refresh button. You can see that it collapsed this panel again, uh, which is an indication that it was reloaded. And when we open it, we get the info that we typed there. Our register and unregistered functions don't do much. They just print something to the screen. So let's see what happens. I showed the terminal here. And when we enable the add-on, you can see hello world. Of course, when we disable, you can see goodbye world, and this just keeps going and going. So now we know everything that's needed to turn our monkey grid operator into a monkey grid add-on. So we're back in Visual Studio Code, and you can see that I've opened the add-ons directory on the side. So you can see I have Blender Cloud add-on installed, and our smallest add-on that we just made. So let's make a new one, create a new file called monkeygrid.py. From my smallest add-on, I copy the BL info into it. I change the name to monkey grid because it's not a monkey grid add-on. It's going to add new meshes, so let's change the category to mesh. Location is still operator search. The description is now even more applicable than ever. Let's keep it all like it is now. Next to what we had, this is the only thing we need. We have a code file that's in the right location, that has the right name, that has the right BL info at the top. And now all we need to do is copy all the code that we already had in that blend file into this file. So back at Blender, I copy all the code, and in Visual Studio Code, I paste it in. Just a quick check that there is nothing weird. This we can remove, because we're no longer running it from the editor itself, but only loading it as an add-on, 
we no longer need that little bit of magic. Save the file, and now we go back to Blender. Let's start with a new file just to be sure, and then go to the user preferences again. Refresh the list, search for monkey, and there we have our monkey grid. We can enable it, let's see if it works. Press F3, monkey grid, and there we are. Our own add-on is working. It's nice that things are working, but things never are perfect in the first run. So what you will do is often go back and forth between your code editor and Blender itself, and then you have to tell Blender to reload your scripts. We've already seen this refresh button in the add-ons list, but that only refreshes the add-ons list. It does not actually reload your add-on from disk once it's been loaded. But first, let's make a change so that we can see that reloading actually did something. Back in the code editor, Let's say we change the default value of count y, change it from 2 to 5, and save the file. Back in Blender, of course, if we redo the monkey grid, we still see 2 as the default value because we haven't reloaded the script. Mm. Press F3. That's not very reload reachable scripts. anymore. That will actually reload your script. And now, when we do monkey grid, you can see that the default has been set to 5. So this is something you will do a lot. So that is it for this episode of Scripting for Artists. To recap, an add-on is just a text file that has a specific name in a certain location on your computer. It has metadata at the top in a BL info dictionary, and it has a register and unregister function at the bottom. And finally, reloading was done with the reload script operator. So this is it. If you have any questions or remarks, please leave a comment below, and I will see you soon. Hello and welcome to Scripting for Artists. My name is Sibudin and in this episode we'll visit a topic that many of you have asked for, user interfaces. In the previous videos we created our own operator and then turned it into an add-on. The basics of creating your own user interface in Blender is pretty much the same. You create a class, you add some properties to it, you add a function to it, and then you register that thing. So in this video we will look at the following. We'll be finding existing UI codes. So if you're wondering how did they do it, after this you'll know where to find it. We'll look at the ingredients of the panel before making our own monkey grid panel, of course. What else? We'll be adding operator buttons to the panel and then tweaking the layout a little bit. Then we'll add scene and object properties to it. And we'll also look at conditional drawing because sometimes there is no active object so you won't be able to draw properties from the active object. And finally, we'll look at adding your own operators to existing menus in Blender. Before we make your own, let's take a look at existing panels in Blender. In the 3D viewport, press N to show the panels, and then let's look at the 3D cursor panel. Right-click and choose Edit Source. If you don't see the Edit Source option, go to Preferences, Interface, and Enable Developer Extras and Python Tooltips, and then it should show up. So let's see what happens if we click it. Blender now tells us here in the corner but it's a bit far away because of my uh, scaling. It basically it tells us to go to a text editor and there we should find the file with the source, but there's an easier way. So if you split this window and make sure that there's a text editor right here, you can click edit source mm -hmm. and there you have the file, it will be opened for you Not and bad. it scrolls to the right line. Now let's scroll through this and see what we can find. As we've seen with operators as a class, it has the That's same kind of cool. Naming. It has the Not gonna lie. Tools and then PT for panel type instead of operator type. And then in lowercase, the rest of the identifier. And here you have the parent class. In this case, it's panel and not operator. You would expect bpy.types.panel here instead of just panel, and we'll see why this is in a bit. Let's look for other commonalities first. We have the label, which is the panel's name in the user interface. And then we have a category, a region type, and a space type. The space type and region type define where in the user face it will show up. In this case, we're looking at 3D viewport and region type is UI, which means it's right in the 3D viewport and not in a header or a footer. Then the category is view, which is the name of the tab here. And then we get to be a label, which is the name of the panel. Where operators had an execute function that performs the task of the operator, here we have a draw function that draws the panel. The drawing itself is done through self.layout, which is a UI layout instance. And you can find this with help and then Python API reference and search for a UI layout, one word. There you'll find the class definition with everything that is possible. In this video, I will show you the basics though, and that will get you quite far already. Now let's go back to the class definition, uh, because we saw that panel here. And this is a little bit different than we've seen before. As I said, you would have expected something like bpy.types.panel and not just panel. 
And this is because in this file it's imported in a different way. Let's scroll to the top. And here you can see from bpy.types import header, menu and panel. And because of this, you can just type panel instead of bpy.types.panel and it would refer to the same thing. Personally, I would say be very careful with imports like this. It can save you some typing and that may sound like a good thing, but you will read code way more often than you will write it. I would always optimize for code readability and understandability rather than saving a few seconds of keystrokes. The only time where I would use an import like this is where it is very clear what's going on. In this case it's Blender's user interface definition and there is only one header, there's only one menu, there's only one panel and they always come from bpy.types. So in this case I would find it acceptable. In general though I would avoid this and always use the full name of the thing so that once you see it is clear where it comes from. Now that is out of the way, let's just jump in and make our own panel for the monkey grid. Let's take a look at our add-ons code where we left off last time. So here we have the monkey grid.py with the monkey grid operator class and the register and unregister functions. Now to this we can add our monkey grid panel. So just like before we create our class, we name it properly. I kept the category view 3D because it's a view 3D panel anyway. We have the PT, I called it monkey grid, and we extend bpy.types.panel. I just copied these values from the 3D cursor panel. I named the category monkeys so that we get our own little tab there, and I labeled it grid. And then the only thing that you really need to have is a draw function. For it to show up as a panel, it needs to have a draw function, even if that function does nothing. And because a function in Python always has to have something, I put pass here, which is Python code for don't do anything. Every code block after a colon is indented, and every indented block needs a little bit of text there in order to make sure that Python understands that it's indented in the first place. So that's why they have the pass keyword. Now the only thing that's left is to tell Blender that this class exists in the first place, which means registering it. So we can just copy the register and unregister class function calls and put in our new class. And that should be it. Let's go to Blender and see what happens. Now all we have to do is reload the script. So go to System, Reload Scripts, and you'll see monkeys pop up here. This route also gives you access to right-click and then add to Quick Favorites. So if you do that, then you can just press Q and Reload Scripts. It will give you a fast way to reload them. When we go to the Monkeys tab, we can see that our grid panel is here. It doesn't contain anything yet. Of course, we don't draw anything there, but at least it shows up. So let's put a button there for the operator. Let's go back to the code. And here in Draw, self.layout lets us draw things. And to draw an operator, you type operator, and then you give the ID name of the operator you want to have there. Let's copy paste that in. Go to Blender, reload the script. And there you can see we have a monkey grip button in the grid panel and it actually works. To customize this button there's a few possibilities and let's go take a look at them. First of all we can change the text that is shown on the button. So let's call it the default grid because pressing this button will just give us the default properties. Save the file, go back to Blender, reload the scripts and now it's called default grid. The nice thing is that if we search for the monkey grid then it's still called monkey grid in the F3 panel because that is the name of the operator. It is just that on this particular spot in the user interface we have a different text on the button. Finally we can add an icon to it and then we have to know the name of the icon. So you can either look at existing code to cheat off of that or you can activate the icon viewer add-on that's bundled with Blender but not activated by default and then in the Python console you get this button called icon viewer. Then you can click on the icon that you want, say a monkey. This is copied it onto the clipboard. Paste it there, save, go back to Blender, reload the script, and there you have the icon. In the tooltip you can also see the description, and you can see that it will actually call our operator with all the default parameters. Let's tweak this and make some buttons that use specific values for these parameters rather than the default. So again, we go back to the source, let's copy this call, and instead of just having this, we can say props equals self.layout.operator, yada yada yada. Let's change this to big grid. Self.layout.operator is a function that returns something. And the thing that it returns represents the properties of our operator. So here we can say props dot, and let's take a look. We had 
count x, count y, and size. So here we can say props dot count x equals 10, and count y equals 10, and size equals 0 0.8. So let's save, go back to Blender, reload the script. We have a new button, big grid, and when you hover over it, you can see that it has different values for those parameters. Delete the monkeys. If you click on big grid, automatically it will take those values, of course. Now, to top this off, we can also make a small grid, and then we have a few more buttons to play around with. So for the small grid, let's set count x is 1, count y is 1, and keep the size to the default, so we just don't mention it here. Save, back to Blender, reload, and then we have a small grid as well which is of course just one, but in the redo panel we can extend this however we want. Now you can also see the value of being able to set the text on that button because it's all the same operator but with different behaviors. Now there's one more thing, I don't like how these buttons are spaced so far apart from each other because they're basically doing the same thing, they're creating a monkey grid and they should really be grouped together. Fortunately we can do this by laying them out in a column. I can hear you ask, but see, when they are already in a column, so what are you on about? Well, a function to create a column has some parameters that we can use to influence the layout. So let's take a look at our code again. Right now, each operator is drawn by calling soft.layout.operator, and we can change it. We can create a column first, and then instead of calling operator on soft.layout, we call operator on call. Save the code. Go back to Blender, reload the script, and you can see they're already squeezed together a little bit more. We can go a little bit further, add a line equals true here, and then they are exactly as I wanted them to be nicely squeezed together. So beside the operators, you can also draw properties on a panel, and this can be pretty much any property that you want. So you could use it to group together these properties that are strewn throughout Blender's user interface, but you use a lot. So for your specific workflow, you can add them to your own panel and make your life a little bit easier. So let's take two properties. One, uh, a property of cycles. So let's say the number of viewport samples in cycles. And the other, I want to have relative to the currently selected object. So let's draw the viewport visibility there. So one of the properties is this guy here, the number of viewport samples. And the other property that we want to add is this one here, disabling viewport. Before we go to the code, let's see what Blender already tells us. So you hover over the viewport property. There it says at the bottom of the tooltip, bpy data scene scene dot cycles dot preview samples. And this is almost what we want, but if we were to use this, we would hard code the name scene in our script. So if we ever rename the scene, then our script is broken already. And also when you use multiple scenes, it also wouldn't work anymore. So rather than using this literally as it stands there, even though in this case it might work, we'll we use the context again and just get the current scene with context.scene. So the property that we want to show is actually context.scene.cycles.previewSamples. Now let's go to the code. Let's add another column. And then we call call.prop to render the property for us. It takes a minimum of two parameters. The first one is the thing that contains the property and then it's the name of the property. So the thing that contains the property is context.scene.cycles, everything up to the last point. And then the name is preview samples. Let's save, go back to Blender, reload the script, and there you have it, preview samples, 10. So we can change this, and you can see that here it changes as well, which indicates that we have the right property. So here you can also add these text and the icon parameters. They work the same as with the operator call, so in order to keep this video a bit to the point, I'll leave that for you to toy with. Now let's take a look at the second property we wanted to add, which is a property of the active object. I want to be able to control the viewport visibility, so that is this guy over here. And there it says bpy data object suzanne.hide viewport. And again, as with the scene, we don't want to do this specifically for Suzanne only. We want to do this for the currently active object, which means context.active object. So the property we're going for is context.active object.hide viewport. Let's just copy what we had change the thing that contains the property to context.active object and 
change the property name to hide viewport and this should render that property. Let's take a look. Click a blender, we reload, and there is the property that we wanted to have. Now let's see if it works. And there you go. It's working, but it's a bit weird because it disappears. And here it doesn't. So what's going on? It turns out when you hide an object, it's no longer active. So that means that context.active object becomes none instead of Suzanne. None doesn't have a property hide viewport, so our code is actually causing problems now. Let's take a look at the terminal where I started Blender, and here you see a rather cryptic error message. Here at the bottom is the terminal where I started Blender from, and it's complaining about the monkeycrypt.py file, line 82, which is, of course, the call that we just added, <coughs> and it says error with argument 1, data, so apparently this argument is called data. Function.data does not support a none assignment. It's a bit vague description, but it does match what I just said. The active object is none, and you cannot draw a property of nothing. So we have to add a little bit of a guard around this code to make it always work. We know that we know that context of active object can become none, so let's check for it. And in that case, let's just add a label. Otherwise, we draw the property as we did before. Let's see how this works now. Reload the script. And there you have it. It says no active object instead of arrowing out, and all the code will keep working. You could argue that this is a bit of a silly button because it only works once, and you would be right. But I wanted to have this example to show you how things can go wrong and how to resolve that. It's also a demonstration of one thing that I find quite important, and that is showing why something is not there. So rather than not drawing the property at all and just silently skipping over it, now we draw the text no active object, which indicates to whoever is using your code why the option is gone. I think that's quite important, so that's why I wanted to have this example here anyway, even though it's rather useless. You now know how to draw your own properties, so it's up to you to make it useful for your particular workflow. Before we end this video, I want to show you one more thing, which is adding operators to menus. Given what we've seen so far, this is rather easy, so this is why I kept it as the last step. Let's add our monkey grid operator to the mesh add menu. So here we have add, mesh, and it would be nice if underneath monkey there was a monkey grid. This means we have to add it to a menu, and there's a trick for that I'll show you. But first we have to know which menu it is. So you can hover here over Add, and it shows View 3D Empty Add, and you'll probably already guessed Empty stands for Menu Type. Now the thing is, submenus don't show this. See, you don't know what the mesh is. But we can look around in the Python console and see if we can find it anyway. It is a type, so it is part of bpy.types dot view 3D Empty, and let's see if we can find something. There you go, mesh add. So this is very likely to be our menu. Calling it here will just give an error, so let's not do that. But at least we have the name now. View 3D empty mesh add in B part of times. Let's copy this and then go to the code. As you would have guessed it, we have to do something in the register and in the unregister functions. And this time is quite different than what we've seen so far. First, we have to make our own function that will draw whatever we want to add to the menu. So that looks something like this. A name that you can think of yourself. And again, self, comma, context. For now, let's put pass in there to make Python happy. And this function basically will be called after the draw function of that panel. So where our own panel has this draw function with self and context, this function will be called with the same self and the same context. So self will refer to that menu in our case. Now let's register and unregister this function. This is done by taking that bpy types view 3d uh, yada 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 and saying dot append mesh add menu draw. The opposite is remove. So in the unregister, we remove mesh add menu draw. Now what to put in here? Well, that's the same as with a panel. We can just call self dot layout dot operator. Copy the ID of the operator, and this should work. 
Let's save and go back to Blender. Reload the script. Add mesh. And there we have Monkey Grid. It doesn't have an icon yet, but now you know how to add one, so I'll leave that for you. Now you've seen how to add your own panel, how to add your own operators to existing menus, but most importantly you've seen how to look at other code. So when you see something that's interesting, when you're wondering how did they do that, you can just right click edit source and most of the user interface elements in Blender are written in Python and then this just works. That's actually so very this powerful. For this episode of Scripting for Artists. If you have any questions or remarks, please leave them in the comment below and I will see you soon. Hello and welcome to Scripting for Artists. My name is Sieglin and in this episode we're going to take a look at custom properties. In the last video we created a panel and added existing properties to it. And this is already quite powerful and if that is enough for your situation then please don't make it any more complex than that. Simpler is often better. However, there are these situations though where you want to attach your own data to things in Blender. To start, let's take a look at the kind of properties there are. Throughout the series you've seen existing properties like object.location or context.scene. Then there are the custom properties that you can create in the custom properties panel. Maybe you've also seen these properties where the edit button is gone and where it says API defined and this means it's been defined from Python. This is what we're also going to look at in this video. To give us a concrete goal to work towards, we'll be creating a mass OBJ importer. Each scene will get a property that contains the path of a folder that contains its OBJ files. And then we'll create an operator that loads all the OBJ files from that folder. And finally we'll look into creating an operator that reloads those OBJ files from disk. So in that way you can have a one button reload of all your OBJ files. This is quite a bit of work, so let's get started. For this episode we're going to create a new add-on, and I've started already. I've added a new Python file, I've installed it as an add-on, loaded in my editor, which is uh, Visual Studio Code. I will quickly race through this because you've seen all of this before in the previous videos. If you haven't seen this yet, please take a look at the videos about creating your own add-on and creating user interfaces. So we start with the VL Info Dictionary. I've set the name to the add-on to Scripting for Artist Mass Importer. The rest of the information is pretty much as you would expect. Import BPy, of course, comes next. Then I want to have everything that we're going to do available to us in a panel. There we can show the buttons, we can show the properties, we can do everything we want. I've created a new panel by copying the code we had for the monkey grid and then adjusting it so it's pretty much the same, except that it has the label mass import and that is also reflected in the class name. It's now called view 3 d PT or panel type mass import. We're going to draw something, but not just yet. Then of course we have the register and unregister functions. Those are necessary for any add-on. We're going to add more classes to this file. So we'll have an operator for doing the mask import, and then also we'll have an operator for doing a single re-import of an object, and then also an operator for doing a mass re-import of all the imported objects. So we're going to have more, and I didn't want to copy-paste the bpyultas register class, and then make sure that in the unregistered, it's also copied to the unregistered class and, and managing all of that. So instead of that, I've created a list called Blender Classes, in which I have only the panel that we have now. And then in the register and unregister, we loop over it with a for loop. So for Blender Class and Blender Classes, we'll go over this list, and for every item in that list, it will call BPYUTO's register class or unregister class. And this makes it a little bit easier to add new stuff later, because new classes we can just add to this list. Now that the code is really simple, let's see that it actually works in Blender, so that we can be sure that when we start adding stuff, we add it on a basis that actually works. So in the user preferences, enable the add-on, and then here in our monkeys tab, we can see our mass import panel. Of course, there's nothing drawn yet, but that is what we expected. So the basis for our code, the registering, the unregistering, and the existence of the panel itself, that's all correct. Okay, so let's start creating these properties that we wanted to have. This is quite simple, actually. You know that there's a lot of stuff in bpy.types, and we want to have a property on the scene that contains the import path of the OBJ files that we want to have. So we start with bpy.types.scene, with a capital C, dot, and then the name of our property. Let's call it mass import path. Now it's very similar to adding your own properties to your own operator except that with the operator we had our own class that we could use to declare the properties and now that class is already there so we cannot add anything to it so it's a little bit different so instead of using the column we use the equal sign 
and then again we assign property. They live in be part of props, and a file path or a directory path is just a string. So that gives us a string property. Now for the user interface, we may want to give it a nice name. So let's call it obj folder. And we always end it with a comma because then I can add stuff on the next line without having to go back up and add that comma again. This is valid Python and it makes your changes a bit more localized. You can now add other stuff here without changing the line above. This is in the register function, so there we add a property. Of course, we have to delete it again in the unregister to clean up what we did. Then basically you take this and you say del that property. And that tells Python, just delete the thing. And this is enough. So let's see how this looks in Blender. Here we have to reload our code. In Blender 2.83 and newer, you can do that here with reload scripts. If you run an older version of Blender, press F3 and then type reload scripts. They both do the same thing, except that through the menu, you can add it to the quick menu when you press Q. And this is the approach that I will use from now on. So we've reloaded our code and let's take a look at the scene. There you go, we have our own property, mass import path. The default is empty because we haven't set any default and it's just there and every scene will have it. We can also change the property from Python. And keep your eyes on the custom properties panel here, which is in the scene tab. Take a look at that, what happens when I actually assign a value. You have to wiggle your mouse a little bit to make it redraw, but you can see that now that we have assigned a value to it, it is actually stored in the custom properties. It's API defined, which means that you cannot just delete it. And this is one of the major advantages of using your properties like this, instead of just clicking the add button here and creating a new one. When you create it through Python, you can be sure that the property is there. Even if it hasn't been set, it will have a default. So it's one less thing to worry about. The other advantage is that we can set subtypes. And this will indicate to Blender what kind of string we're talking about. So this is going to be a path, and it would be nice if it had like a little button that you could have a file browser that selects the path for you instead of having to type it in the Python console. All of this is done by Blender once you set the subtype correctly. So let's do that. The subtype is set by the subtype parameter, and then, yeah, that's a string that indicates a subtype. In order to find the subtypes for a specific property, you can go back to Blender, help, Python API reference, and search for bpy.props.string property, and there it will tell you which subtypes there are. In our case, it's a directory path or dir path. So now let's reload the code and see what happens here in this corner of the interface. There you go. It has a button to browse and you can select directories. Because I set it to a silly value, it will just start at a silly directory because it's not a valid path. But if I change this to slash slash, which indicates the current directory of the blend file, it will open it here and I can navigate to my OBJ files directory, click accept, and then it has set here the path. And this is exactly what we wanted, except that we want this behavior in our own panel, of course, and Let's do that. In our panel code, we can remove the pass because we're actually going to do something. And let's start with getting the layout. So we didn't do this before, but do know that every self.something will do a little dance to see, is it defined in this class? If not, look at the parents, is it defined there? If not, look at the grandparents, etc. So we're saying layout equals self.layout. We only do this dance once and then just use the found layout object. Let's add a column and then add the property. The property was defined on the scene, which is context.scene, and the property name was mass import path. That's it. Reload the code, and there we have our property, browse button and all. Now let's go and create an operator that imports all the OBJ files from that directory. And I want to name it quite similar to the operator that already exists for importing OBJ files. So let's take a look at that. That is bpy.ops.importscene.obj, so let's call our operator importscene.obj mass. So here we have an empty operator, you've seen this before, I just named it differently, it's called importscene.obj mass. 
it has an execute function, I put in this little comment as a reference, and then it calls self report. This takes a report type, which can be info or warning or error, and then a string that is unreported. It returns cancelled because nothing is done yet. Again, I'm taking small steps. I first make sure that the operator is there and that it's registered properly. Then we can add it to the panel. We can click on the button. We can see that it works before adding more complexities to it. So the operator is here now. I copy this name. I go to the Blender classes list. I add the name to the list, and that takes care of the registering and the unregistering. So what is left now is added to the panel. So all we need is the the ID name. Paste it in. Save in Blender. Reload the script, and we have our button. We click on it, it says no code to load from slash slash, which is the error that we expected. Now the next step is finding the OBJ files and importing them. And afterwards we want to be able to re-import them, so we have to keep track of which object was imported from which file. The best way to do that is to add another property to the object type, so let's do that now before we start actually importing them. Here in a register function we're going to do the same thing as we did to a scene, but then to an object. And then it also becomes a string property, but then with obj file instead of obj folder. So the folder and the file name combined will give us the final path of the obj file. Because there is no subtype for just a file name, it's only for a full file path or a full directory path, we'll just keep this as a string and don't define any subtype. So before we look at the importing, let's add this property to the panel. We have the panel code here. Let's create a new column for this. I'm not sure if it's a good idea to go through this portal. And there we have the portal. I don't know what expects me on the other side. Can be none, so we have to add a little guard around this. Oh, looks good. Looks good to me. Very intact. None is considered false with Python, and a real object is considered true. So if context.object will evaluate to true if it's a real object and then draw the property. It will evaluate to false if there is no active object and then it will draw the label instead. Let's give it a try. And there we have our property and we can set it for object, as you can see. Now let's build the importing itself. So here we are at our mass importer operator. Let's write a little layout of what it is supposed to do. It has to find the object files, and for each file, import it, and record its file name in the object property. Let's look at that first step. This is going to take a few steps, actually, because for finding files, we have to use Python functionality. And Python doesn't understand the Blender-specific slash slash meaning of relative to the current Blender file. So we have to convert it to something that Python understands, then use that to find the OBJ files, then convert it back to something Blender understands, and import the files. First of all, we have to turn that slash slash into something absolute. And this is done through a function in bpy.path. bpy.path, the ADS path, or absolute path, will give us the absolute path of the file that we want to import. Somebody Check griefed this my water grief. This in our error message. Just pause the video, give this a try, and then come back here. Oh, I won't. And Sorry. And this to a path object from Python's pathlib library. And then we can use this import path variable to find all the obj files and loop over them in one go, like this. This will find everything that matches star.obj, so files or directories ending in .obj. Now for now I will just assume that you won't create any subdirectory called something.obj and that everything is an actual obj file that we can import. Now all we have to do is import it. Here in Blender, go to the obj importer and press Ctrl C and then you can Ctrl B code. This converts the path object that we have back into a string so that Blender understands it. And then this whole line will import the OBJ file. So now we have covered the for each file imported. And the only thing that's left is recording its file name. 
Part of the working of this import operator is that it deselects everything and then it selects the objects that are imported. And this means that we can loop over all selected objects and then assign our custom property to them. And this is why I like the pathlib object so much. It is quite simple to work with. If you just want to have the file name component of a path, you can just do the path dot name. Uh, if you want to have the drive letter, you do dot drive. And it's a very object-oriented approach to paths, and I quite like that. Now we're importing, we record the file name where it came from. So this should be it. Let's give it a try. I'll throw out the existing objects. Browse to my OBJ files directory, and then mass import everything. And there we are. The files are imported, they're all at the origin, and each of them has the OBJ file name set to whichever they came from. Now all that's left for us is to make an operator that reloads the OBJ file. To keep it simple, let's not do this on mass and just reload the active object. That means deleting the object from the scene and then loading it again from the OBJ file. Of course, before we delete it from the scene, we have to make sure that we store the transform of the object so that when we reload it, it can be restored so that it's positioned in the same way as it was before we reloaded it. First, let's start with a new operator. Let's call it obj reload. Here, I select some text, I press Ctrl D, and that will select the next occurrence of that text. So then I can just type reload, and both the class name and the ID name will be changed to, to obj reload. Let's say reload mass imported obj, and then we can write the execute function. For this code, I will assume that every obj has one object in it. You can extend the code so that it can handle multiple objects per obj, but let's keep it simple for now. We're going to refer to the active object quite a few times, so let's make life simple for us. And just call it ob. So let's make a little overview for ourselves again. First, we have to store what we want to remember. Remove the object from the scene, load the obj file, and restore what we remembered. Loading the obj file will not automatically set our custom property. In the end, that's what we want to restore, and we want to be able to restore the transform as well. Let's remember the file name, and let's take a copy of the matrix. If I wouldn't make a copy of the matrix, then the variable matrix world would be a reference to the object's matrix. And if we delete the object, that reference won't be valid anymore, and you can get all kinds of weird results. Now, removing the object from the scene actually means removing the object from all the collections that it's in. Fortunately, Blender gives us a list of all those collections. This will unlink the object from all the collections. But the problem is that, of course, well, as soon as we unlink the object from the first collection, this thing that we're looping over will change. Changing something while you're looping over it is never a good idea. We can do this, list of users collections, and this will create a new list for us. That new list is a copy, so it won't be altered by removing the objects from the collections, making this for loop safe. But if you want, you can also remove Okay, boys, I, I, I'm done. I, I cannot handle one more sentence of Blender scripting. It all just flies through my mind. Um, but it was definitely a fun watch and very educative. Well, for sure, I was kind of like not paying attention and so on. But um, yeah, I, I think I, I, I got some core parts of it and... I'm somewhat interested in scripting. I don't know if I will ever try it out, but if I ever feel the need, I know that it exists and that you can easily look up things by just right clicking and activating the developer settings. That's something I, I like really um, uh, took from this video. Um, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's enough. And also I'm kind of, um, yeah, satisfied with the performance of the server it is not like a crazy overperforming hardware but um it is okay um 
it is kind of exhausting to push the limits of the server alone uh, by a, a simple cow farm and yeah that's that's enough for me i'm sure you can build easily build uh, with uh, not too much effort some lag machines that can um completely uh, kill the server's performance that it's unplayable but yeah yikes i mean that's something you can barely um yeah uh a, a road is that is that a word you can use uh yeah you, you can never be sure that the minecraft server performs because like by the definition minecraft servers are pure crap um Oh, a fight at spawn. Interesting. Yeah, but that's it for, for this episode, for sure. Um, yeah, make sure to check out the server. It's reachable under the domain zillihoon.com. Um, and... Yeah. <laughs> This is such a creepy chat. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh man, it's... <laughs> it's too funny. Oh boy. I, I can't handle it. <laughs> I'm so sure he's bluffing. I doubt he knows the location. But I think 2B2K is, is really is really getting getting the chills. <laughs> wow. What a cliffhanger. Who knows what happens next? On Laser Gurkenland. <laughs> Make sure to join and find it out yourself. For daily adventures in vanilla uh, Minecraft environment. Okay. Well, that, that was enough from this uh, advertisement episode, and see you in game. <laughs>